Hey, Four C Divers! Welcome to Facebook Live with Four C, and it is September. It is Shark Month, and we have a fantastic presentation for you guys. So stay tuned. First, let's check in and see how you guys are doing. Um, if you don't know my name, I'm Nicole. I am your social media gal, and we've got Gary Rose, Dr. Gary Rose, excuse me, uh, and he's going to be our guest presenter tonight. And he's going to tell you a little bit more about himself and a little bit more about what he's presenting. But first, like I said, it is Shark Month. It is um, our favorite month here at 4C. So let's go over to the website. There it is. If you go on our website, we have this really cool web uh, landing page that tells you a little bit about all the different shark ecology courses, diving with sharks, what's it like to dive with sharks in Florida, and you can shop our cool shark products. And if you spend $50 or more, we'll send you a shark magnetic bottle opener. So it's awesome, Paige. Go out there and check it out. All right, let me go back. Okay, there we are. And let's check in. Let's say hello to everybody. Where are you listening in from? Are you here in South Florida, in the state of Florida, outside of Florida? Where are you listening in from? We want to know. Say hello to us and type it in the comments. Guys, we also want you to let us know if you're enjoying the presentation by hitting the like button, the smiley face, or the heart emoji. We love to see participation. So if you have any comments or questions throughout this presentation, write them in and our guest speaker or myself, we will answer them for you. Also, you guys know the drill. You need to make sure that you're registered for tonight's event. Go to www.forstashy.com, go to the event tab, and click on tonight's presentation and register before 645, because after that, it cuts off. And then I download all your guys' names and emails, put them into a random name picker, and we will be handing out free fills for your tanks tonight. So we will be doing that so make sure to register by 6 45. all right so look at that gary everyone saying hello to you thanks you guys for tuning in and like i said it is september shark month here at 4c so we have lots of cool things that we've planned throughout the month and we are coming to the end of the month so you know you have another week to figure out what you want to know about sharks if you want to take a shark ecology course if you want to do some shark dives if you want to watch our Facebook Lives, which what you're doing right now. This is a way to learn about sharks. And we have a fantastic presentation for you tonight. We have Dr. Gary Rose here. He is the man. Here are our local diver, photographer. He's, I mean, he's going to tell you more about who he is and what he does, but I'm going to go ahead and let him start. I'm going to bring your PowerPoint over, Gary, and uh, you guys can go ahead and enjoy this presentation about the sharks of Florida's coast and the Caribbean. So you're not going to read my bio. This is embarrassing. <laughs> uh, no, you can uh, let's see. You it, it all started by watching Jacques Cousteau back when I was a kid. And many of you I see coming in on the side uh, are of the same age. And I saw the, um, the um, trailers for the new Cousteau movie. And the one thing I noticed is the photography is awful. We've come a long, long way. But again, back in the 1940s and 50s and 60s, uh, he, he, he was an amazing fellow. I got certified in 1974. I've been diving ever since. Um, as the world changed, the environment changed, so does diving. I became a dive instructor uh, six years ago. I'm a member of Dan. Uh, their medical team. I'm a member of the Underwater Hyperbaric Medical Society. I'm a surgeon. I'm a microbiologist. But my passion now that I'm retired is diving, running, playing golf, and publishing lots of articles in Alert Diver and X-Ray Magazine. And I'm in the middle of writing a book. Uh, I will invite you at the end of my talk to a very special event. I hope everyone can come. I think you'll be very surprised. I got to see it today as a preview and it blew me away. So I'm going to get started. I'm going to talk about sharks of the Florida coast and the Caribbean. This is my personal experience and I see, well, I don't see anything now except my PowerPoint, 
But before I came on, I saw a lot of my friends who I've been diving with for years who can give the same talk just as well as I can. Uh, the hardest thing about this talk is for me to talk to this little green light, knowing that you're there and I can't interact with you. I love to interact with audiences. And as this COVID thing gets settled, we'll go back to that. And do get your booster. I got mine last week and it only hurt a little. All right. How many times have you been diving and you look up and you go, shark? Well, what kind of shark is that? Wouldn't you want to know? I mean, part of the joy of diving is knowing what the nudibranchs are and the corals and the, and the uh, sea, the different structures. So you look up, it's a shark. What is it? Um, here we are on a, a shipwreck here on the uh, Jupiter wreck track. And it'd be really nice to know if this was a lemon shark or a tiger shark or a bull shark, especially you see this photographer approaching very closely, uh, she would really like to know what she's dealing with. Or you're diving the wall and you look up, and this is uh, in San Salvador, and you see this beautiful shark glide by about 100 feet above you. You really would love to know what it is. And by the end of tonight, just by this silhouette, you will know that this is a reef shark, just by the silhouette, and I will teach you how. Now, what's more important, to know what this shark is or this shark? Well, it happens to be this is a lemon shark that you don't need to worry too much about. This is a 14-foot tiger shark. You might want to think about what this shark's behavior is. Are you guys able to see my arrow moving on here? Someone say something? Can you see my cursor, Nicole? Uh, no, you can't. Okay, let me go back to the, my screen and I won't use the cursor. All right, and then this gorgeous shark comes by and many people who are expert would think this is a bull shark for many reasons. But it happens to be a very pregnant sandbar shark that looks a lot like a bull shark. Uh, so we're swimming along and we see what nature does to sharks. Oh, my goodness, I just realized a lot of my talk is using the cursor. Um, Nicole, is there a way that I can show people what I am looking at? Uh, somebody tell me, not really. All right, I'll have to use my words. It's hard to do. I don't talk much. <laughs> All right. I'm gonna, also, when I go back to the screen, I can't see the chat. So, you know what? I'll stay on the... I'll go back to it. Okay. And then when you come up to the surface, you want to know what a shark's behavior is. Is it an ambush hunter that as you get to the surface, it looks friendly and all of a sudden it bites you? Or is it a puppy dog that's going to follow you up and play with you and let you take all kinds of cool photos of light streaming on it? Uh, I love this photo. It's one of my favorites. This could be me. It could be you. You're watching Sharknado. And you're wondering, are these sharks friendly or not? Well, you need to know their behavior, what they are. All right, this is a carving that came from Mexico from 40 uh, AD, and it's a shark, and sharks are in our history and in our art. Nanue from Polynesia, a beautiful tattoo, but Nanue was also one of their gods that would become a shark by day and a man by night. In the 1500s, the Europeans thought a lot about sharks. And then one of my favorite paintings that hangs in the National Gallery of Art is Watson and the Sharks, painted by uh, John Singleton Copley in 1778. Uh, this is a highly stylized painting, but you get the idea of the terror that sharks can evoke in people. Another one of my favorite paintings hangs in the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. I used to study this painting all the time when I was in college and medical school. Uh, and you see this poor guy on a dismasted sailboat surrounded by sharks, and you see a schooner in the background sailing away, a water spout about to descend on him. And this painting, every time I float, when the weather is bad I'm on a boat that doesn't have a group, but you go individually with pairs and you have to put up your, uh, your flotation, and I'm floating, I always think of this, this, this painting. 
So I always wondered, happened to this guy, ever since about 1971, the first time I saw this. And it wasn't until three years ago, I found the sequel painting, also painted by Winslow Harmer, three years earlier. So this painting is the prequel to this painting. So we know the poor fellow did not make it, and the sharks are all very full. Then we move forward to Mattapasset and the big incident that occurred there back in the 1930s that led to Jaws. I don't know about you, but I don't like swimming on the surface ever since I saw Jaws. I'm very happy to be in the water with sharks, but I'm not happy on the surface as a swimmer. Give me a snorkel and a mask or scuba gear, I'm good. And I absolutely do not swim on the surface at night anymore. And I live right on the beach and I miss it. But Jaws changed everything. Then, oh, there was supposed to be Jaws music, but it didn't come through. Then Shark Week came around. At the beginning, it was scientific, and it taught us about sharks. Then it became a stupid reality. It, it's a, I won't defame it, but it's not very good. All right, so when I have a crowd of people, I will say, someone please tell me what is going on in this shark's mind. But since I'm talking to a little green light, I'll do it for you. The top picture, uh, this is in Guadalupe Island, uh, and this is a great white shark looking at the cage going, wow, I am really hungry. I want to get in there. The bottom left photo is I'm trying to get in. I can't get in. I can't get to this guy. And finally, I'm attacking the cage. I'm going to bite through and eat this guy. Well, that's what we all think. But what's really going through this great white's mind is, whoa. Someone locked that poor human in a cage and dropped him in the ocean. Don't worry, little buddy. I'll get you out. Now, with a live audience, that brings a lot of laughs, and it's really hard to be speaking to the little green light and have no feedback whatsoever. All right. As I said, I don't like swimming on the surface because on the surface, a swimmer, a surfer looks like a sea turtle or a sea lion, which are really favorite foods of great whites and tigers and other ambush hunters. What is a shark? A shark is a eating machine. Their job is to eat. They're like the raptors. They're like ospreys. They're like hawks. They're like eagles. They eat little things so the environment is cleaned up. Sharks are apex hunters. If we eliminate all the sharks in our seas as they're trying to do currently with this Chinese fishing fleet and, and the Scandinavians, uh, we will have a dead ocean. An example is in South Carolina a few years ago, they eliminated the hammerheads. Well, the, the, the stingrays went crazy. They didn't have a predator to eat them. So the stingrays went ahead and, and ate up all the clams and oysters. So South Carolina does not produce them anymore. Another example, I forget which island it is, but they killed all the sharks and then, therefore, the, the larger reef fish, the groupers and some of the larger snappers, ate all the smaller reef fish that ate the crustaceans that kept the reefs clean. Now their reefs are dead. One, in this state of Florida alone, in a single year, shark tourism, not fishing, shark tourism, divers, us, you and me, we bring in $225 million a year to the state of Florida. If you take all the shark fins and all the sharks that have been butchered in that same year, in the whole United States, it brings in $1 million. One shark in the state of Florida, in its lifetime, one shark will bring in $25 million. So, a shark is a eating machine that has a very large, powerful tail that whips back and forth as to get it from one place to another to eat. It has a strong, non-bony spine. It's made of cartilage. Sharks are entirely made of cartilage except for one tiny little piece of uh, their jaw. And they have a huge liver, and that's why sharks can eat a lot of things and not die. And that's why bull sharks, because they have large kidneys and livers, can go into fresh water. So we're going to learn how to identify the different parts of a shark. On the surface of a shark, there are denticles. They're very much like teeth, and they're like scales, but they're not quite either. So we call them denticles. 
and that's what protects them from the environment. They don't get parasites or infections. If you look at them, they're grooved, and that allows them to swim through the water and cavitate the salt water. And what that does, it forms little bubbles along each of these grooves. So the shark is swimming through less dense water than you or I are. And that was the principle they used about 12 years ago for the U.S. Olympic team, their wetsuits. Uh, they, they killed all the environment, excuse me, competitors, because the suits were cavitating with grooves. So they're illegal in the Olympics. Sharks have a lot of senses, but the coolest of all their senses are represented by these yellow square, I'm um, sorry, the uh, green things that you see around the eye, the little squiggly lines with the little green endings. Those are the ampulla of Lorenzini, ampulla of Lorenzini. Each ampulla has in it nerve fibers and they detect electromagnetism. So when you're diving and your heart is racing like crazy, the shark knows you're afraid. After you've done a few dives with them and you're calm and your heart rate is at 72 or 68 like mine, the sharks know that you're not afraid of them and they get a little worried about that. Why aren't you afraid? They also read your brain waves, your alpha waves, your beta waves, your lambda waves, your delta waves, and they know your peace of mind and what you're thinking. And lastly, the cool thing is those of you, and I see many names, I, I can't say it now, who dive with the sharks regularly, did you ever notice that certain sharks like Jenny or Patrick or um, Miss Snooty or Stevie, they tend to gravitate towards certain divers and they keep going to those individual divers. There's a reason for that. We all have an electronic signature. They recognize us. They're coming over to say hi. They know who you are. They don't know your name, but they know who you are, just like a puppy dog or an adult dog recognizes you by smell. So Ampule of Lorenzini is a powerful sense. And here I have a magnification of the snout of a um, lemon shark, and you can see all those ampulla, all those little dimples are ampulla. Remember these ampulla when I get to hammerhead sharks, and, I'll, and you'll see why. Just remember these little uh, ampulla. All right, another great sense they have, and a lot of other fish have too, is lateral line, and that's represented down below with that red uh, line going down there. And each one, like we, has at its base nerve fibers, that sense pressure. So when they feel pressure changes, they can hone in on it. So do you ever wonder why is it, you know, you don't see any sharks as soon as you shoot a fish with your spear gun, boom, they're there. They feel those pressure changes. Now, one would say, I know someone's thinking, well, they also hear the click of the release of the spear. Well, if you use a Hawaiian sling or if you use a pole spear, they don't hear that. But they feel the pressure changes as the fish is wiggling in the water and it transmits a great distance. Another really cool thing that some sharks have, uh, I'm sorry, all sharks have and some have the other, is if you look uh, to the right beneath where it says a shark's eye, there's a word, tapetum lucidum. And what that is, it is a layer that's reflective that's right below the retina of the eye. So if you think of the retina as the back of the eye, right behind it is a reflective layer almost metallic. So at night in particularly, or in dark days, light comes in, as you see from the left, it enters the eye, goes through the lens, through the retina and is registered, hits the tapetum lucidum and shoots out again, and gets registered again and goes back and forth, back and forth. They have like, when we wear night vision goggles, they see the same thing because of their tapetum lucidum. The other thing that not all sharks have, but tiger sharks really have, that's really cool, is if you see this animation on the left there, that's called the nictitating membrane. If you notice, whenever a tiger shark, well, those of us who have seen them, go to eat, they, they'll approach a, an object like this, and here we see a tiger, and there's the eye looking straight out. And if you look at the bottom of that photograph, you'll see there's a white, almost looks like a quarter moon. That's the nictitating membrane starting to come up. I waited a long time, so I was able to get that to show it partially up so you can see it. And then here's the membrane in place. It looks like the eyeball is rolling up in their head, but it's not, it's that membrane. So every time 
a tiger shark and some of the other sharks will bite down anything, that memory automatically goes up so that they can protect their eye from any kind of damage. Another uh, thing that sharks have is just like we have in our throat a hyoid bone, when they open their snout to eat, the jaw drops, the hyoid drops, and that's why you see these little shark mouths, all of a sudden they open up about this big, and I'll show you some pictures of that. All right, let's talk about teeth. We can identify sharks by their teeth. Lemon sharks have these really pointy, cool triangular teeth, and these are the teeth you usually see sold at uh, different uh, seaside tourist attraction places because it's really easy to wrap those with wire and wear them around your neck. Bull sharks have serrated teeth. By the way, bull sharks after alligators have the strongest closing pressure of jaws of any animal in the animal kingdom. So bull sharks have serrations so they can crunch through big fish. Now, if you notice that tiger shark, it's serrated, but it's shaped in the same shape as a can opener. And there's a real good reason for that. Phylogenetically, uh, evolutionarily, they love turtles. So having a can opener and a thousand of them in your mouth to bite through a sea turtle shell, it's a very highly adaptive tooth. Uh, so really what you really want to do is go up to a lemon shark and wait so you can see all their beautiful little teeth staring there at you just like that. Uh, this is a fun photo, but you can see those teeth. There's no other shark that has teeth that look like a lemon shark. Or if you look at a tiger, uh, this, is, uh, this is actually Jenny. You can see the teeth uh, on the bottom row there. Uh, they're serrated and they're tilting back uh, just like a can opener. Uh, whale sharks don't have teeth. They strain the water. All right, now we're going to start getting to the nitty gritty. How do we identify sharks at a glance? Well, first, it's good to know that there are three types of shark families. There's pelagic sharks that are open ocean like oceanic white tips, blues, mako sharks, and it's really rare to see them on a dive here in Florida because they're deep ocean. If you want to see blues and makos, go to Cabo or go to Rhode Island. Coastal sharks are what we mainly see here, duskies, silkies, sandbars, tigers, lemons, or reef sharks. And then we divide them further into ridgebacks and non-ridgebacks. In this photograph of a sandbar shark, if you look at the dorsal fin, it's so hard to do this without a pointer, just behind it, you'll see there's a ridge. And that's, that's what makes it a ridgeback. And those are the dusky, silky, sandbars, reef sharks, and tiger sharks. Everything else is not. So if you see a shark, you're not sure if it's a sandbar or a bull, look at the back. And if you see a ridge, it's a sandbar. If it doesn't have the ridge, it's a bull. That's one nice little way to do that. Um, coloring, blue sharks are blue. Silky sharks, when there's proper lighting, have a gorgeous cop copper color. And when they're closer to the surface, that copper is just absolutely exquisite. Uh, tiger sharks have bars and stripes. Whale sharks have bands and spots. So you can identify colorings and markings. And I have a picture of a black tip. I'll show you. They have black patches that are very particular. A lot of people confuse reef sharks with black tips because of the coloring. And I'll show you. Then there's unusual features. Nurse sharks have barbels right at the front of their face, snout rather. And if you also notice, the only two sharks in this area that we see that have a snout and mouth at the same location are nurse sharks and whale sharks. The very front of their snout is where their mouth is. All other sharks, the mouth is on the ventral or inferior surface. Unusual head shapes. When you see a hammerhead, you know it's a hammerhead. It's not, oh, I think I saw a hammerhead. You know it when you saw it. And then one unusual feature are to tell silky sharks from sandbars or reef sharks or bull sharks is, again, I can't do it with a pointer, but if you look at the big tail, go forward and you'll see the anal fin below and right above it is the second dorsal. On the posterior surface, the back side of the dorsal, so here's the dorsal on the back side, it has this thing sticking out. It's long like a worm. And that's how you can tell silkies from duskies. And then there's size. If it's a humongous, like 30, 40 foot shark, probably a whale shark. If it's 18, 20 feet, might be a great white. You're not going to see a lemon shark that's 20 feet long. 
and then black tips are small, four, five, six feet. And here, give you an idea, on the bottom, the green shark, that's a great white. The lavender shark is a whale shark, and then above it are what they think Megalodon uh, sharks might have been. So size matters with sharks. Yep, size matters. Okay, shark reproduction. I'll leave this up for a moment, but I don't want to spend too much time because I want to get to the identification and answer questions. But certain sharks, such as bulls, hammers, most of the ridgebacks, give live birth. And that is a evolutionary advantage because as soon as the baby shark is born, it swims away before its mother can eat it or its brothers and sisters can eat it. Uh, oviparous sharks lay eggs. We don't have any around here that do them, mainly off Africa and Australia and New Zealand and in Polynesia and that area. But we do have nurse sharks and great whites and tiger sharks. They're ovoviviparous. They start off with a egg inside the uterus, inside the body, and the eggs hatch within. The stronger, more developed sharks that hatch within the mother shark will then eat the other shark eggs. And when they're, they're born, they swim off and, they're, and they're, the strong survive. And then hammerheads, under very unusual conditions, can auto-fertilize. Uh, they have testes, and, well, not testes. They have male and female organs. All right, what do sharks eat? Other sharks, seals, sea lions, rays, turtles, whales, porpoises, and seabirds. And if you really want to see this in action, go to Guadalupe Island off the coast of Mexico, and you will see all of the above as sharks eat them. And in my uh, Great White Shark Lecture, Contrary to an article that was just published in one of our journals, and I'm not going to say anything negative about it, that they said that great whites don't eat turtles, they do. I've seen it. I have a photograph of it. Okay. Lastly, before we get into the particulars of each shark, we want to look at the tail. If you look at the photo on the top, that's a great white shark. If you look at the tail, that's called a lunate tail or crescentic tail or caudal fin. Fin. It's shaped like a quarter moon or a crescent moon. And we see that in oceanic white tips, makos, and great whites. Most of the other sharks have non-lunate, as we see in the bottom drawing. So the top portion is large, and the bottom portion, or the, or the ventral portion, is smaller. And we see that in almost all of our sharks around here. Then if you look at the dorsal fin on the great white, it stands out. You don't see the other dorsal, but just for a little nub. But in some sharks, like the lemon shark, the second dorsal, like we see in this drawing, is almost as large as the first dorsal. And that's a real tip, and we're going to look at that in just a moment in real examples. All right, so now we're going to go into the identification part. Now, some of this is going to be repetitious for some of the divers that I recognize signing in who've seen a lot of sharks. But for new divers, one of the things I always laugh at when I was an instructor is when you're on a dive boat that has a lot of new divers, anytime they see a shark, they go, bull shark, bull shark, bull shark. It's crazy. They don't know how to identify sharks. So I'm going to show you how to do it in clear water or murky water or basically silhouette form. There's lots of ways to do it. And it's so makes diving more enjoyable to know what you're looking at. Plus, it makes it a lot safer. You, you don't want to be out, well, I'm going to show you in a moment, but you don't want to approach a nurse shark in the same manner that you'd approach a tiger shark. You need to know the difference. So speaking of nurse sharks, I'm going to start with a nurse shark. The most prominent feature of a nurse shark features are the following. You see it has two large dorsal fins that those little arrows are sitting on top of, and they're almost equal size. Notice both of them at the level of the pelvic fin, that's the fin in the middle, or back. They're way, way back. Look at the tail. There's only an upper portion. There's no lower portion. And there's a great reason for that, and I'll show you in a moment. And lastly, at the front, their mouth is at the very tip of the snout. So let's look at one. Gee, kind of almost exactly the same. You see how the two fins are way back. You almost always find nurse sharks laying on the bottom. 
And that is why they don't have that ventral or volar or bottom portion of the tail. Because if they had that nub sticking way down, like you see in lemon sharks or silky sharks, they couldn't sit on the bottom. So that over the millions of years, that has through evolution disappeared. By the way, sharks have been on this planet. I've seen on Facebook people say 10 million years, 20 million years. They've been here longer than any um, cockroach. They've been here 400 million years. That's right, 400 million years. And then also notice on the nurse shark, uh, on this photo, you can see the barbels right at the front of the snout. And they use those barbels uh, same, very same way as catfish. They're always like moving the barbels along the bottom shifting the sand up so they can find their favorite food buried in the sand. So that's typical of a nurse shark. Uh, and here we see the barbels and the mouth in the front. And nurse sharks are so underrated. They're really cool. They're really cool. And when you get a nurse shark like this in the middle of the water column, it is so wonderful to be able to get a picture of it. Blue, clear water, the sky above with a little bit of the wave action. This is one of my all-time favorite photographs. And here we see the photo that shows it all. In the back is a nurse shark. You can see the two fins are set back. The, one, the forward dorsal fin is at the level of the pelvic fin. I'm sorry, the pectoral, no, pelvic fin. And in the front picture, you can see the barbels very nicely. All right, that's in contradistinction to the lemon shark. The lemon shark, the second dorsal, the back side one, is a little bit smaller than the front, but notice the front dorsal is way forward of the pelvic fin. It's midway between the pectoral fin or the chest fin and the pelvic fin. So when you see a dorsal, two dorsals, you, you narrow it down to nurse shark or lemon shark. And if the first dorsal is midway between the pelvic and the pectoral fins, you got it nailed. But lemons are a lot cooler. There's other things too. Oh, also notice on the tail, the bottom portion sticks out because lemons swim around a lot. They don't sit on the bottom too much. They have those really cool teeth I told you about. And here we see a male uh, uh, lemon. Notice the two dorsal fins. They're almost equal size. The tail has the bottom piece. So you know it's a lemon, not a nurse. And then lemon sharks always look like they're smiling. It's so cool. Uh, they just always are smiling. And that's because lemon sharks, their behavior, they're like puppy dogs. Lemon sharks will come up to you and they'll poke at you. They'll prod at you. They want your attention. They want you to be there. They want you to see them and acknowledge they're there. Uh, just be careful if you're a photographer. Your strobes, when they're on, emit a very high frequency electric electromagnetic waves and lemon sharks love to chomp down on thinking there's some kind of fish in distress. So if you see a lemon shark getting near your strobes, just angle your camera away a little bit. Another tip dealing with sharks if you're a photographer is I learned to always shoot from the chest. I use wide angle. I don't ever look through my viewer. I always shoot from the chest because as long as you maintain eye contact with a shark, it doesn't see you as weaker. This is particularly true with tiger sharks. You never take your eyes off. But I've noticed with lemons and other sharks, as soon as I look at something else, they're right on me. So learn to shoot from the chest. It's a little difficult at first, but you can do it. Notice the teeth. Lemons love to come up to the surface, up the water column with divers. So if you're a new photographer, if you are comfortable with a GoPro or a new camera point and shoot, the most wonderful time to shoot lemon sharks is when they come up to the boat with you and you get these wavelet sunlit rays. It's nice to capture a little bit of seaweed sargassum so that way you have complementary colors. It, light, it just makes the picture come alive. And if you get a diver in there too, it gives a little bit of dimension. Uh, play with the light. Uh, this is a cool photo because of the, uh, the light. And uh, this next photo is uh, one that I've won a few awards with. Uh, these are lemons coming up to the surface. And once you learn your camera, how to use your strobes, natural lighting, 
they are really great subjects for photography because they keep coming around. Uh, in fact, Snooty, uh, named by Alan Egan, uh, Snooty is a local celebrity. She's a diva. People come from all over the world to see her because of that smile. Uh, she is just a fun shark. Uh, and another thing, if you're photographing or you're with sharks, don't chase them. New divers, new photographers, if you swim after them, they're just going to go away. Just wait. I promise you, they will always come to you. And I'm guilty. When I first started diving, uh, I won't name names of dive operators, but one of the dive operators used to yell at me for chasing sharks until finally I realized, huh, maybe they know what they're talking about. Kind of like golf. The harder you try to hit the ball, the worse it is. The slower and easier you swing. If you sit back and let the sharks come to you, they will. I promise you. And the same thing with giant manta rays and Socorro. Just wait. They'll come. Build it and they will come. All right. Caribbean reef shark. This is a really cool shark. They're very active. They love divers and they love to steal your fish. So if you're a spear fishing, uh, you have to be careful of Caribbean reef sharks because they'll come up and take the fish off of you. Uh, the highlight of the Caribbean reef shark is location, location, location. They hang out on the reef. That's why they're called Caribbean reef sharks. They're basically almost the same species as white tip sharks, as Galapagos sharks, as gray reef sharks, different locations, different names. But to pick a Caribbean reef shark out, if you look at the dorsal fin, it says apex of first dorsal fin acutely pointed. Yes, it's a very pointy dorsal. I'll show you in a moment uh, what that looks like. The other highlight is along the poster, the back edge of the fin, there's a dusky color, a darkened color, almost always. And also on the tail fin, the caudal fin, the entire margin is dark or dusky. So here we see that sharp, pointy dorsal fin. If you look at the posterior aspect of it, the backside, you can see there's a dark line. And then you look at the tail, you can see there's a dark line sweeping along the whole tail. Also, location, location, location. This is a Caribbean reef shark doing what a Caribbean reef shark does, hangs out on the reef. Now, having said that, a few times a year, and I'll show you a picture in a few minutes, we'll be out there three, four miles out on the deep ledge, and sometimes the sandbars will be feeding, or sometimes the uh, black tips, a Caribbean reef shark will venture in. It's always a treat to see a Caribbean reef shark in deep water, but they hang out on the reef. Here is a Caribbean reef shark. Look at the tail, it's a large tail very large tail. They have silver color, but you can see the dark pigmentation along the posterior aspect of the dorsal fin and on the tail. Someone posted one of these a couple days ago on Facebook and wanted to know what it was, and people came up with all kinds of cockamamie stuff. This is a Caribbean reef shark, and that's what it looks like. The pointy dorsal fin, it's angled back a little bit, and the coloration. This is what people confuse it with sometimes, bull sharks. First of all, bull sharks are big. They're much bigger. They're fat. They're fat like bulls. They're muscular. When they're swimming, you can see their muscles rippling. It's kind of like watching Hussein Bolt running. You see those muscles contracting. Well, bull sharks are the Hussein Bolts of the water world, at least in Florida. They are massively muscled. Also, look at the dorsal fin. It's triangular. It's equilateral. Each side is about the same length. If you remember geometry from high school or wherever school you went to, maybe when you went to school, it was grad school. Just kidding. But the dorsal fin is equilateral and it's sloped. And it's sloped at about a 45 degree angle, whereas the reef shark, that's about 75 degrees. And you can see it's pointy and narrow. On a bull shark, it is not. It is equilateral. So when we're diving off the deep ledge, here's the dorsal. It really looks like I said, this is a big mama of a shark. Knowing the behavior helps too. Bull sharks will always send one scout out first. That scout comes to investigate who the divers are or diver, swims around, does a couple circles. Oh, comes and says hello to each diver, swims around, and then swims off. And you go, wow, 
with a letdown. That's because he or she is the scout. Swims off, disappears, and then the wolf pack comes in. And this we see a lot in the winter, and we see them in the spring, we see them in the fall, but the wolf pack comes in and it's magnificent. When they come in, they are amazing. Now, bull sharks are not too bright, but they are really intense. And when you swim with them a few times, you get your comfort level, your brain waves are relaxing, your heart's relaxing. You sit back and those bulls come in, they're beautiful. But be careful, never take your eyes off the bull, never trust the bull. Oh, and if you're spearfishing and a bull wants your fish, you give it, you don't fight it. I know two people, one guy almost lost his leg and the other one almost lost his lower leg because they were shooting cobia on the wrecks and the bull sharks came in. You just give up the fish, you, you, you can't win. All right, tiger sharks, I love tiger sharks. I love them, they're my second favorite. Why? Because they're really big, they're really cool, and they're really scary. And when you're in a dive boat for the first time, and they give you the pre-dive talk, when the dive master tells you what to do around tigers, you best listen. Uh, look at the next issue of Alert Diver Magazine, it should be out within the month. I wrote an article about when people don't listen to the dive briefing with tiger sharks and what can happen. Next issue of Alert Diver. Tiger sharks you can't confuse with anything because they have those bars and bands and stripes. And what's really cool about tigers, each one has a different bar banding pattern and you can identify them. And here in Jupiter, we rec, oh, and there's the teeth that I mentioned before. They have different patterns. This is Jenny. You just look at her, you know by the pattern of her bands and bars. She's a, last time I saw Jenny, she was 14 feet. She didn't come this season. Uh, um, hopefully she'll be back next season. Uh, that's Jenny, and here she is again. They're very curious. Notice she's almost on my port, and you can see the nictitating membrane partially closed. So she's protecting her eyeball. They're very curious, and they love to photobomb. Uh, on the dive briefing, they'll teach you what kind of behavior to have you, but you never, ever take your eyes off a tiger. They are ambush hunters. You take your eye off. Bad things happen, and you'll see in my article in Alert Diver. And it happened to me. On my first time diving with tigers, uh, I took my eye off, and one of the people took a picture of a tiger shark trying to bite off my regulator because I wasn't paying attention. I'm not going to ask you to do anything I haven't done, and there's no mistake that you'll make that I haven't already made. Making mistakes gives us experience. And if you have a lot of experience, you become an expert. Think about that. All right, one of my favorite photos, this is a just floating above Jenny as she just saunters beneath me. Uh, this is, is actually, a, this is my Facebook edition. There's a lot of particulate in the water. Since then, I've cleaned it up. It's, it's a beautiful experience to have this 13-foot gorgeous tiger shark just gliding beneath me. And she's probably three or four feet below me, so it's wonderful. Uh, this is the only photo I'll show you that I did not take uh, on the bottom left. Jeff Joel took this photo, and that's me face to face with Jenny. And that's how close you need to be to get some of the good photos. And another thing, when you wear bright stuff, tiger sharks are curious. And this shows it right there. This is another tiger coming in on that pink fin. And one of the people that are on this uh, program tonight, I saw their name come up, that's that person. But I know two shark feeders who are very successful and one wears orange fins and one wears pink fins and they've had no issues. Your regulator is shiny. Your SMB is red or yellow. So I don't know how much is myth, how much is true, but here's a typical tiger shark being very curious. They love to come in, they're very curious, they're great to photograph. Uh, I call this one heavy metal. This is a, just a spectacular feeling. And they photobomb. Here we have Miss Snooty coming in for a photo and I move my camera to grab Jenny coming in from below, but that's what happens. And what's better than a tiger shark? Two tiger sharks. 
So sometimes you'll see two or three in a single dive. Never take your eyes off. All right, hammerheads. What do they look like? Well, there's nothing that has a hammerhead like this except the hammerhead. But we want to be able to distinguish the two main species that we see here in these waters. And that's the great hammerhead and then the um, scalloped hammerhead. The main feature of the hammerhead, of course, is the hammer. If you look at the bottom uh, photo, you'll see that the front edge of the hammer is got little scalloping in it, but it's pretty straight. Versus when I show you a scallop, you'll see a different shape. But the hallmark, to tell them apart, there's two things. If you look at the dorsal fin, it is humongous. The dorsal fin of a great hammer is always, 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 and I'll say always one more time, at least the height is the same height as the thickness of the body. If that dorsal is any less than the thickness of the body, then it's not a great hammerhead. And I've seen some scallops with pretty big dorsals, but there's something else you look for. Look at the pelvic fin. That's where that little bald arrow is pointing. It's curved like a moon. It's called lunate. Great hammerheads have a curved pelvic fin. I've seen some of my photographer friends show photos of great hammers, and they weren't. They were scallops, and I'll show you the difference. So great hammers have that massive dorsal fin. Look at it, guys. It's huge. It's bigger than the thickness of the body. And if you look at the pelvic fin, it's curved. Now, the front part of the hammerhead is called the cephalofoil. Cephalofoil. Cephalo is Greek for head. Foil means wing. They use that mainly as they're sweeping back and forth on the bottom. They love to eat stingrays. That's their favorite food. So along that entire cephalofoil, there are thousands of ampulla of Lorenzini. So they're picking up electromagnetic energy from beneath the sand, much like a metal detector. And they can find the stingrays based on their electromagnetic magnetic energy coming out of the sand. There is a great study that was done, I have that for another talk, I believe it was by Neil Hammerschlag, that shows that the head in no way, shape, or form contributes their swimming efficiency. Many people thought it gave them lift. It doesn't, and it's a great study I would tell you to look at. And they also have really cool teeth. Now, I've been diving for a long time. I go to Bimini to dive with the Great Hammerheads. We see them here, uh, down in uh, Key, Elliott Key. I saw the, the back in the 70s, I saw the shark that was called Hitler, if you saw that on Shark Week, and he was 20 feet long, scared the bejesus out of me. That was when I was a brand new diver. But hammerheads don't attack people. All right, from the front, you know it's a great hammerhead. Look at the height of that dorsal fin. It's way, way up there. Now, scallop hammerheads, you can see that the head is slightly curved, the cephalofoil, and you can see even though it has a large dorsal, nowhere near the magnitude of a great hammerhead. So here we see a scallop, the, the front, the hammer is curved, the cephalofoil. The dorsal fin is not as great, but look at the pelvic fin. That's the one in the middle on the bottom. It's straight on the back. It's not curved like a great hammer. Here's another scallop. Okay, now I'm gonna zip through this part and come back to it afterwards. But we have three species of shark that are in now, sandbars, duskies, and silkies, which are ridgebacks, and people confuse them all the time. So I'm gonna show you the difference. Silky sharks have a curved dorsal fin that's angled back and is narrow. And if you remember earlier, I said the back side of the second dorsal fin has a worm that sticks out from it. It's not a worm, but it's an appendage. And that's how you can tell a silky from any other shark. They have a pointy snout and long fins. So again, I don't have a pointer, but here's a silky, you can see the copper color. And if you look at the second dorsal fin, you can see that extension going all the way back about four inches. The other thing to know about silkies, besides the small curved dorsal fin, is their skin is called silky because those denticles are tiny. So you rub a hand over it, it feels like silk. It's not rough like sandpaper. Here we can see, again, the poster 
curve of that dorsal fin that's rounded. And if you look back to the second dorsal, tiny dorsal fin, you can see that that wormy appendage is sticking out. Also notice that the dorsal fin, the first dorsal fin, starts off right at the same plane as the attachment of the pectoral fin, right there. Whereas with a dusky, which I'll show you in a minute, it starts just behind that. Now, one of the problems with silkies is we see them a lot with hooks in their mouths from fishing. And I'm not going to get into the politics of that. I, I am giving a press conference this Friday at 1 p.m. I do talk about silkies and shark fishing, and I invite you all to see it. It's online. Uh, here's a, a result of fishing and what happens with long lines and kingfish hooks. Uh, it just tears them apart. The good news is they all heal well, as long as they can open and close their jaws to eat. And you can see they have beautiful long fins. What's better than one silky? Two silkies. All right, now dusky. I'm going to go a little faster. Their dorsal fin is a little bit shorter. It's a little bit broader, and it curves back a little bit more. But also look at the second dorsal. It doesn't have that little wormy thing sticking out. Also, their snout is a little bit broader and shorter. So you can see the dusky, though it looks like a silky, look at the dorsal fin. It's not quite as narrow and fine as a silky. The snout is a little broader. And you can see here very nicely, if you look at the second dorsal, there's no worm appendage. And again, I apologize. I like to have a pointer to show that to you. And you can see the snout's a little bit broader than the silky. Okay. Sandbars. Oh my God, I love sandbars. Those of us who see them and dive with them a lot, we call them the sharks, the, the ghost sharks. They look like ghosts. And I'll show you why in a moment. They have a very large dorsal fin, not quite as large as a hammerhead. You can see here in portion, the dorsal fin is almost as large as the thickness of their body. Also notice, unlike the silky, where the dorsal fin is way back of the pectoral, on the sandbar, the dorsal fin starts right in the middle of the attachment of the pectoral fin. So this is what sandbars look like in the water. When you're diving in the water column, they come up one, two, or three from below circling. They come up from real deep, and they circle. And this is the color without any strobe or anything. They look like blue ghosts, and they're really so dainty and beautiful. And for years, we've seen them. Now they're coming in to greet us because they recognize us. And with a strobe, you can see how massive that dorsal fin is. It takes off from the mid part of the pectoral. Uh, from the side view, you can really get an appreciation of that dorsal fin. And that's the sine qua non of identifying a sandbar shark, is that large, broad, beautiful dorsal fin. And from the front, I'm wearing my Neptunic shirt. You can see that the sandbar shark is the model for Neptunix, and it's nice to get that triangle photograph. They're really pretty. And from the front, their mouth almost looks like a lizard shape. You can see they, they, they're not sharky looking from the front. And here we see the blue ghost, and there's that dorsal ridge that I told you about, just behind the first dorsal fin. So that's the sandbar above, the large dorsal, the takeoff from the middle of the pack, the dusky, the dorsal fin is broad, curved, set back, and then the silky in between the two, more dainty with that little wormy appendage. So normally when I have a crowd, I'll say, what is this? And everybody will go, it's a silky. No, it actually is a reef shark with a long, pointy dorsal fin, doesn't have the wormy thing, the color is from the light. All right. Black tips, we have the migrations twice a year up and down the coast. We hear about them all the time. January and I think June. The hallmark of the black tip is if you look at the pectoral fin, the pelvic fin, and the bottom part of the caudal fin, tail fin, it looks like they're dipped in black ink. But other thing that's just as important, you look at the anal fin where that little ball and line is pointing, always looks like it's dipped in white paint. If you don't see that white paint on it, it's probably a reef shark uh, with a lot of color on it, and I'll show you. So here is a, um, a black tip. 
They're hard to photograph. They're small, they're four or five feet, they're fast, they whiz around. And uh, one of the shark uh, boat owners showed me a really cool thing to look for. You look at the side of the black tip, there's like a Z for Zorro, like a racing car. And this picture just shows that huge Z. But it also shows the black tips and the white paint. So you need to see the black edges, the black tips, and that little white fin in the Z. Now here I have a photo. This is a reef shark in the front. It has that tall, thin, curving dorsal fin. But in the back, you can see, I hope you can see it, but if you look at the pelvic fin and you look at the tail fin, and you can just barely see it on the anal fin that's white, that's a black tip in the back. And you can see the fin, the dorsal fin is broader than a reef. Whale sharks we see from time to time uh, every year here. If you really want to see them, go to Isla Mujeres, Mexico in July or August, and you will see hundreds of them. Uh, I'm only putting it here because they're so easy to identify. Every year we see one or two. Uh, we have in this area blue sharks, short fin makos, threshers, and white sharks. I used to say that I've never seen any of those in these area, this area, but I was diving on South Florida uh, dive um, operator and coming up on the ladder. And just as I, I, was, I came up, I got my camera, but not in time. John Chatterton was right behind me. And as he came up, a spinner shark just spun up right behind him. If I had been one second quicker, I could have had a picture of John Chatterton and a spinner shark. And I used to say we don't see white sharks. Well, six months ago, I was diving up on the, group, on the deep ledge, and I saw a white shark. This is a great white shark, for, uh, Guadalupe. I'll just show you because I just want to brag for my photos. Uh, but they have a pointy snout, uh, a triangular dorsal, but nothing else looks like a great white shark. It has that white belly, that dark black eye, the pointy snout. And they also look like they're smiling as a little body. Uh, one I saw on the deep ledge, I did not get a photo of it, it was about 40 feet away, but the other divers with me saw it also. So we do have great whites, and if I give my great white lecture, I'll show you the migration pattern. We're beginning to find out that hundreds of them migrate through Florida water a year. All right, so we're going to have a quiz. I don't know how we're going to do this. Um, I guess what I'll do is I'll show it to you, and Nicole, if you have any way to communicate to me, maybe by phone or whatever, we'll see what people think. What is this? If there's no way to communicate to me, I'll wait a moment or two. It's pretty obvious. Um, let me see if I can do it this way. Yeah, I can do it that way. Does anybody want to uh, put on chat what that is? Okay. Yes, Karen, Nett, and Kristen. Yes, that is a nurse shark. Two dorsal fins. The first dorsal is at the level of the pelvic fin. It has the barbels and typical nurse shark. Okay, now I have to go back to here. Next, we have who wants to tell me what this is? And this is the end of the lecture. Uh, well, I think Lisette, yours was from the last one, as Miguel's was too. Anybody want to tell me what this is? I have one person said sandbar. Uh, here we go. Michael Tavell? No. Michael Tavell. Bull shark. Absolutely. Um, Miguel, Meg, a lot of people are coming in bull. And the reason it's a bull shark is first, look at the dorsal fin. It's equilateral triangle, uh, equal sides, short, wide snout, very muscular and dusky pigmentation. I can see why a few people thought it's a black, but you don't have that dipped in ink appearance. Okay, how about this one? I'm looking at the chat. Nobody? Ah, here we go. Yes, everybody's correct. That is a tiger shark. You can tell by the uh, bands and the bars and uh, the massive fatness of the head. 
By the way, this was taken here in Jupiter on a very poor visibility day. But when you do enough of this, you learn how to set your strobes up, you learn how to angle it, you learn what settings, and you can get pretty nice pictures even on crappy days. Okay, next. Oh, this is a good one. I'll give you a hint. There are three of them together coming up at, coming up. Look at, what are the features we look at? We look at the position of the dorsal fin. Ah, very good. We have a lot of sandbars. Yes, the dorsal fin is really tall. They have a blue ghost-like appearance. And you can see I have it head-on inside you that that dorsal fin is really big. So congratulations. That's not an easy one. And I see one of the shark divers who I dove with the sandbars many times uh, who is a um, good job. I, I don't want to use names to embarrass anybody. Okay. Next, what is this? And I'll be wrapping this up in five minutes, so we stay on time. Yes, people coming in sandbar. The mat, and that's the reason I put this in, was because this is a little bit difficult. But to really tell these sharks apart, especially the ridgebacks, you need to see them in a side view. And that large, beautiful dorsal fin and a delicate snap. Now, this one is pregnant. So it's so fat, it looks almost like a bull shark. But remember, the bull shark, the big slope to the dorsal fin, and it's, it's about 45 degrees, and it's equilateral. All right, this is a gimme. If anyone, I hope everyone gets this one correct. Wow, I'm looking at the names here. Hi, guys. There's so many of you I haven't seen in so long. I can't wait to go diving with you again. Um, email me, text me. Let's go diving. Okay, the first one to get it was Alex. It is a silky. If you look at the two dorsal fins, they're almost equal size. I'm sorry, not silky, lemon shark. If you look at the two dorsal fins, they're almost equal size. The first one, the first dorsal is midway between the pelvic and the pectoral. And you can see those sharp little spiny pointy teeth. So that is a lemon shark. All right. This one's a little bit difficult. And while we're looking, I have a website, GaryRosePhotos.com. It's shown up a few pictures. Uh, I have lots of photos, and they're all for sale if you'd like to take a look at them. So this one. Look at the dorsal. And Sophia, yes, it's a Caribbean reef shark. It's on the reef. Uh, you, you won't see many of the other sharks this close to the reef. And it has that long pointy snout and that pointy curved dorsal. A lot of people are coming to the Caribbean reef. There's a delay on the uh, chat, I see. Daniela, you're doing great. You, you got in the mall so far. Good job, Daniela. All right, next. All right, everybody knows what that is. I need a full shot. So let's see who comes up with it. Yep, 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 yep. Well, Sharp, you only have to see one dot and one bar to know that. Good job, guys. All right, we're almost, oh, okay. This is a hard one. What is this? I'll leave it in large form a little longer. There are three things to look for. I apologize for the particulate, but this shows this shark exactly as it should be seen. Very good. Scalp hammerhead, most people are saying. And we know that because one, the dorsal fin is not massive. It's less than the thickness of the body. Two, the cephalofoil is arched curve. 
And three, the pelvic fin has a straight edge to it. The posterior edge of the pelvic fin, instead of being like a moon shaped, it's straight. Very good. Very good, people. Very good. All right. What's this? This is a front view. So you don't get to see much of the features, but you should be able to tell me what this is. A monkey wrench shark. Very good. <laughs> Uh, if you're a quick typer, put down what it is that you know that define. Oh, you're all getting it now. Oh, Patrick, I'm impressed. Uh, yes, this is a great hammerhead, and all you have to do is see that dorsal fin, and you can see how tall it is in comparison to the body. The dorsal fin is taller than the rest of the body's height. You guys are on fire. All right, here's a real tough one. Ready? What's that? Very good, very good. Right, this was a fun photo. When I first saw it, when I took the picture, I didn't know I had this result. But it just happened to be that I lined up with the cephalofoil in such a way that the hammer, you don't see the hammer, the cephalofoil. But you still know it's a great hammerhead because of that huge dorsal and the great curvature of that pelvic fin. But it, it's a fun photo. I, I, when I give these lectures live, I, I love to hear audience responses to this. All right, almost done. All right, what do you see here, guys? What do you see? I'll leave it here for a moment. I'll wait for a few more. Eddie McCormick, you are the bomb. Yes. Everyone's putting nurse, 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 nurse. Eddie saw that huge dorsal fin in the background. There's a great hammerhead too. That's great. And this is how they approach. Hammerheads, particularly great hammerheads, are really shy. And they come in from the distance, and they'll go back and forth to feel out the situation. And if you start making lots of movement or pointing, they're not coming in. So this guy was using these nurse sharks as a shield, kind of hiding. And I was prepared, so when she finally came in, I had all my settings right. But you got to look at your environment and see what's going. So really good job. All right, this photo is very typical. What is it? I know there's one person I hope that answers this before anybody else. Uh, Miguel, I don't have any photos of thresher sharks or spinner. Or else I did, but I mentioned they're in these waters, and you almost never see them diving in Florida waters. All right, so we have our first lemon. Yes, this is snooty, and I love because it was picked by. Sea Shepherds and was featured on the last night of Shark Week as their feature photo in Europe. So I was very proud. I donated that to them on their request. I don't know how they knew about it or found it, but that was Shark Week Europe. All right. This one, I think we have two more. Yep, that's Snooty. A lot of you identified her. I think Danielle is the only one who's gotten everyone right. Good job. And Tyler's got many right. I think all of them too. Oh, here comes Debbie. Yep, I knew you'd come in, Debbie. Yep, that's a great white. Very typical. Uh, well, you can tell by the dorsal fin, the very sharp pointy nose. You don't have to see anything else to know it's a great white. All right, this one's a little 
little bit more difficult. There's something I did not go over, I forgot to mention, that's a feature of this shark, but you should still be able to get it by working through the levels that I mentioned. So take a look at the different relationships of what you see, and then I'll tell you there's one other thing I forgot to mention that would help you with this one. Yes, I knew my, my, my girls would come through. It's a lemon, absolutely. Good job, Lisette and Sophie and Debbie. All right, you know it's a lemon because you can see the two dorsal fins. You can see the mouth, the shape, but lemon sharks have short, stubby, pectoral fins. They look almost like the bat signal when they set up the bat signal up in the sky. That's to me what lemon shark fins look like. They're short and stubby like that. And this is the same thing. This is a lemon shark and that's the bat signal if you cut off the bottom of the picture. So also if you're looking up, look at the shape and the size of the fins. So um, I am an invited speaker, not speaker, excuse me, I have been invited to exhibit uh, climate changes through lens at the Arts Garage. The premiere with a cocktail party, which I'm inviting all of you to, is this Friday the 1st at 6 o'clock at the Arts Garage. I have multiple photos, many which you've never seen, that will be on exhibit in their large format on metal. And I will give a talk about the climate, what I've seen happen here in these waters after diving here for 50 years. Uh, I stopped crying about it. Now I've become a, a speaker on behalf of the, our waters, and I'll be happy to discuss this with anybody anytime, but there are definite things that have happened that have made our waters so nasty, but there, we can save them. So please come this Friday night, six o'clock, the Arts Crush, downtown Delray, and I want to thank you all for coming. I'm going to take myself off now so I can hear you and take questions. If Nicole is there, if we can unmute or go through chat. Nicole, you can field them, and I'd love to take questions or comments or anything you have to say. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much, Gary. That was fantastic. Thank so many you. people did such a good job on that quiz. It's amazing, you guys. And I don't know if that's just because you already knew what these animals were or Gary did such a great job at making sure you understand the um, features to look for. So I think a round of applause, everybody. Yay, good job. Um, all right, so a couple of things I'm just looking. Uh, I did have a question. Um, somebody um, wanted to know, it's, it's too far down the timeline. Gary, somebody wanted to know, um, what sharks are protected in the state of Florida? in state waters? That's a good question. You know, I don't know the answer. It's the first time <laughs> in a long I time. I think I do know the answer, so I'm gonna go ahead and give it a shot in the dark, but I, then maybe you can help me with it. I know that um, all three species of hammerhead, um, I know it's the great hammerhead, the scallop, and the, um, is it called the smooth? Uh, this smooth, yeah. Yeah. This is smooth. Okay. And then we have um, the tiger sharks and the lemon sharks. And Linda's saying great whites. You know, so I think that's, that's the only ones that are protected in Florida. I, I want to I expand upon that. First, it's the first time I've been asked a question I couldn't answer. And like I tell my students, you don't know, just say I don't know. But I will make it absolutely concrete in my head by tomorrow morning. The other thing yeah. is the FWC allows shore fishing of those sharks. Those sharks are not illegal to fish from the shore, which makes me sick. Some I would almost put it in this lecture, but I didn't want to give it such a negative vibe. But some of you saw a photo that I posted on Facebook a few months ago of a lemon shark tail just from the second dorsal back that was probably not on the beach more than five minutes when I came upon it. Uh, when I came back an hour later, it was already had flies on, but it, 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 it's awful. The shore fishing is bad. And we do know that um, our friends from the American Shark Conservancy, uh, they do local work in shark research. 
and conservation. And so they have been working with some of the local fishermen with the um, catching to try and get release rates, um, you know, to be a, a more, an easier thing on the animals. So uh, they do a lot of great stuff. So if you guys are interested, go to their website, American Shark Conservancy. That's a local Florida um, research and conservation group. And um, yeah, so the, the reason why I brought up that question about, um, oh, here we go. Tyler said the lemon, the tiger, whites, hammerheads, and 22 other species. Really? I didn't think there was that many. Hmm. So anyways, the, the reason why I bring it up is we talk about state waters and then we have international waters. And the one thing that we need to be clarifying is that state waters here on our coast that we are diving, it's three miles offshore with state waters and then beyond that is international. So these animals, especially like a ham, uh, uh, the tiger shark, which we know will migrate from us over to the Bahamas, they cross over into those international waters and they might not be protected in those waters. Now they are protected in the Bahamas when they get over there, but in between they don't. So there are fishing boats, long liners that will line up and put, you know, long lines out right there and to be able to catch some of these things. So, um, yeah. You know, definitely, we're definitely noticing a decrease in the number of sharks. There's absolutely no question about that. The lemon sharks are still prolific, but all the others are down, way yeah. down. And so we just have to be aware as divers to know that state waters and international waters, you're not protected in both. You know, that's the way that the, the laws are, are written for these animals. So just be aware of that so that <laughs> when you guys are seeing stuff, make sure you're making reports because FWC will investigate. So, um, all right. And um, everybody is super excited to, I would think, come to your gallery opening. I so, hope so. Yeah. So I'm going, really I'm going to discuss what is happening and why. It's not just fishing. It, it, it has a lot to do with deforestation. It has a lot to do with the Sahara Desert. It has a lot to do with a virus. Uh, and it's been going on since 1983. When I used to dive here in the 70s and early 80s, 360 days a year, the water, the biz was 150 plus. And the reefs were prolific with elkhorn and staghorn. And we had hogs and yellowtails and groupers everywhere. But uh, I just want to say thank you to everyone. I, I'm seeing all the comments coming through, and I'm glad that people like my talk. I, I'm passionate about sharks and diving. And uh, my email is GaryRoseMD at AOL.com if anyone ever wants to reach out. Or you can also reach me at GaryRosePhotos at gmail.com. But I'm always open to questions. I'm, I'm a shark fanatic, and I hope I see everybody this Friday at 6 o'clock at the Arts Garage. Drinks awesome. being served. Great, thank you so much. And you guys remembered that you registered for our raffle. I'm gonna give away some air fills, air or nitrox. So here's everybody's names. And let's go ahead and hit the random name picker. Here we go. Da, 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 da. Oh boy. I don't know how to say that name. Freya, hopefully I said that right. Freya Reynas, you get some air fills to 4C. Awesome. All right, if you're listening, give us a thumbs up. Give us an, um, woohoo in the comment section. And you know what? I'm feeling generous. Let's do another name. So da 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 da. And Martin Cherry, you also get some air fills or nitrox fills at 4C. So I will be reaching out to the two of you via email. Make sure that you respond back to me so that I uh, know that you are a real person. <laughs> I sure hope you are because you registered and that you're here in Florida and you want to use those fills and we will get you out there to go diving. And we appreciate Dr. Gary Rose for taking the time to teach us about the sharks here, identifying them and the cool features. 
Thank you, Gary. Thank you, everybody, Thank for you. listening in. All righty. Have a great evening and join us next uh, on Thursday. We are doing the sawfish sighting presentation because it had to be rescheduled. So that is on Thursday at 630. All right, guys. See you later. Thank you for all your hard work, Nicole. Really appreciate you. You're Thank awesome. You. All right. Bye, guys. Thank you.